so I, there's a couple areas where I think the contrast between the two sides are not clear. I think law and order is definitely one. Um, the Our streets uh, have to be safe. That's a prerequisite for everything, dealing with the health crisis, the economy, everything. The president's been really clear on what we need to do. I think the other side is not. Uh, immigration and border security, I think, is another issue where literally we're offered two different visions. One's for secure borders and enforcing the law. The other's not. Um, and uh, on foreign policy, this president has had a willingness to show toughness and, and, and make hard decisions and, and, and lead in peace through strength. That was not the record that we had in the Obama years. And I, I can only assume that the same people are going to come back and, and do the same policies that, that didn't work four years ago. So that's that's not a partisan assessment. It's just just the facts. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with you. I mean, as someone who the name of my show and all over Twitter, I'm Stacy on the right, but I, I can appreciate a nonpartisan straight from the, uh, you know, the thing that's missing right now, Jay, the fourth estate where they just report and act- accurately reflect what they heard and then kind of say, look, this, this is what this one said. That's what that one said. I love that. I think it's helpful for us when we do take a step back and look at things from that viewpoint, which leads me to the president's acceptance speech. It was lengthy. Um, it was kind of a magnum opus in some ways. He did crack a few jokes and make people laugh. He did go after, uh, you know, uh, the candidate on the other side pretty hard, Biden. What did you make of what he said last night in the way of accepting his party's nomination? Well, I thought the most interesting thing was he didn't say anything new. He said all the things we expect from this president in the way we expect this president to say them. And he enunciated the policies that he has been following in the last four years. And it's very clear he will follow the next four years. So it's like, you you know, you know what you're getting here. I think whether you like it or don't, like when Ivanka said, you know, some people like the way my father was speaking and tweeting it. You like it or you don't, but it's very clear that with this candidate, you absolutely know what you're getting. I don't think that's disputable. I think your your point on the fourth estate, though, that is so important. I mean, one of the things, if you just listen to, and as I have, the, the, the commentary of the conventions is incredibly partisan. And, you know, and the reporting on the streets, I think, is incredible particularly dangerous. I mean, we have seen so much reporting, which really tries to ignore or dismiss the organized criminal violence in Portland, Seattle, and other places. And and this is, this is not just partisan reporting. What they're doing is they're normalizing violence. They're making violence seem normal. And that's just incredibly dangerous from people who are supposed to be respected reporters of what's going on in our country. So the normalization of the violence. uh, Okay, Jay, can we just talk about that for a second? Last night after the speech, um, Rand Paul and his wife, he's a senator from Kentucky, for people who may not, you know, know all of them. um, They were leaving the event and they were attacked. They were literally just a hair's breadth away from him being re-injured. Remember, he was actually shot by a kind of a hardcore leftist a few years back and struggled for his life for years afterwards. And now he's well enough to be back in the Senate and, and just walking down the street with his wife after the speech and the protesters, it had it not been for the Capitol police yet again, I think they might've killed him. Well, I, I got to tell you the, the big mistake is they, they went out on the East side of the white house. I, I left on the West side. There was like one guy there screaming and I just like zipped by him and I was out of there. So that the strategic error was there were thousands of protesters, but they were on the, the North side on, um, Lafayette Square and on the west side where they had a lot of buses like like taking people back. But I do think that this gets back to the normalization of violence comment is, um, you, know, they, you know, they had a guillotine out there. They executed a mock Donald Trump. And of course, you know, that's legitimate free speech. But the 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 threatening physical threatening of people coming out of the building. And remember, we are in covid and they're yelling, screaming, spitting at these guys in very, very close quarters. Um, it's a huge, it's, it's, it's usually unacceptable. And it's just, I, I can't imagine 
that anybody would look at that and say, that's okay, that's normal, that's, that's, that's the way we should be demonstrating and protesting for what we want. I just, just thought it was abominable. So, and it, and it also instills a lot of fear, which, you know, so here I come at you from the mom, you know, I put my mom hat on, which I really never take off. Um, it makes people fearful. Like it makes people think, well, am I okay to go out to an event? And whether it's political or not, am I safe in the streets? Like what if I'm coming out of dinner and these people just happen to be protesting outside? What will they do to me? That's a very real fear for Americans right now. I mean, or and you're in D.C. Like, I think people might might not realize you work in D.C. You live in that area. Um, the streets of D.C. are cordoned off. And, and so it's really a walking zone because they don't want people to inadvertently turn into a huge Black Lives Matter protest. So do you feel safe? Do you feel like people that you work with at Heritage and others that are in that same area packed with, you know, lots of different people, lots of different people working in different areas? Are you guys safe? Well, I, I did feel safe in, until last night. I mean, we're sitting there looking at Twitter, and looking at these massive crowds and everything. And, you know, I was thinking, like, how are a thousand people who came here peacefully to listen to a speech going to safely get? So, I, yeah, I was worried about the uh, uh, people's safety. But f- here's the fundamental problem here, which is when you have a situation in which people assert their moral authority – over the law, and then, then that assertion of more author, moral authority, in a sense, is unbounded. In a sense, anything you do, any violence you do, is justified because you are acting in accordance with your moral authority. That is really fascism. That is the ultimate expression of fascism. And so the irony here is. And I'm not look. Let's let's be honest. Most I'm sure everybody got out okay, and they're all fine. So. But look at the people in Portland and Seattle and many other cities. They they can't walk their streets. Their their neighborhoods aren't safe. Their businesses are destroyed. Nobody will come to their businesses. The these people are out screaming and yelling that they're fighting for the people, and the people they are hurting most are the people that are living in these cities. Uh, you, it, it's, it, it's almost Orwellian. So I, it, it reminds me of uh, Peggy Noonan wrote about this in the Wall Street Journal this week. She talked about uh, how similar these latest acts of violence in Washington, D.C., where protesters are surrounding people in, in the city who are seated at lunch eating. And the protesters right. surround them and scream, you have to put your right fist in the air and say Black Lives Matter, or say the name of one of the people who have been killed by the police and have converge on you. And there's video of it where there's a single woman seated and they're surrounded. Right. And as you mentioned, they're they're screaming. Some of them, their masks are down. The spittle is flying. She's sitting there with a the mask on, but it's there's no social distancing and they don't seem to be concerned about, the, you know, the Rona, as I like to call it. Um and she likened that to struggle sessions, which was something that went on back, you know, in, in China when they were just turning into a communist nation. Anyone who had differing ideas had to be subjected to a public struggle session, vilified, humiliated, sure. their social capital removed from them. And anyone who participated was then complicit and therefore co- completely bought into the new the new movement. Yeah. Do you do you it, agree it with that fashion. assessment? I, mean, I don't know how else to describe it. And. And the, the fact that they call themselves, um, you know, a- anti-fascists is, is, you know, greatly ironic. Look, here's here's the bigger, the, the real issue. It's not even the protests. Is, is there's obviously organized criminal activity behind this, right? Somebody is funding it. Somebody is uh, supporting it. Matter of fact, there's reports that there, there are credible reports of people who are riding in Seattle who are on planes flying to Washington, D.C., uh, and, you know, and so what's, what's the deal there? Like they're in Portland and then they've got the, they're getting a plane ticket and they're flying to Washington, D.C. to protest. So, you know, in the United States, organizing criminal activity is in itself a crime. Uh, this is what we created the RICO law for, to go after the mafia. And I, I think the federal government and, and state and local governments, they need to be really focusing on trying to uncover the organization behind this, identify these people and arrest and prosecute them. 